Hello, everybody. Should be on. Uh, we are here for Good Friday. Thank you so much, Allison. And the word Isaiah 53 was powerful that Allison started with. I will be looking at Psalm 22. It's very interesting. From both of those Psalms, the rabbis uh, came up with a name for the Messiah in Isaiah 53, which Allison read and commented on. Uh, it talks about this disfigured, marred individual beyond even human recognition. And from that passage, the rabbis called the Messiah the leprous one. In other words, marred and disfigured as a leper. And again, it's a, a picture, a prophetic picture of Jesus, our sin bearer, our Good Friday sin bearer. In Psalm 22, which we're going to read tonight, the Lord, the title he receives from the rabbis, from a, a portion that the Lord shall not abhor the affliction of the afflicted one, the suffering one. The Messiah was called the afflicted one. So we've looked at the leprous one and the afflicted one. We know that this is Holy Week, which started last Sunday, Palm Sunday, and of course leads to Resurrection Sunday. And we know that the events in terms of the church's liturgical calendar. Uh, yesterday was Holy Thursday, today is Good Friday, Holy Saturday, tomorrow, and then Resurrection Sunday. And on Holy Thursday, Holy Thursday is when Jesus reveals that he is the fulfillment of the Passover meal. Uh, he also would have, uh, besides celebrating a Passover meal, sung the Passover or Egyptian Hallel uh, would have been recited and sung. In fact, when Jesus and his disciples go out into the Garden of Gethsemane after the meal on Holy Thursday, it said they, they sang a song. They, uh, they, they sang a hymn, uh, a psalm, and that would have been Psalm 118, which of course is uh, a clear, clear prophetic passage it describes the events of Palm Sunday and the the days surrounding it so Holy Thursday speaks of revelation Good Friday of course speaks of atonement it speaks of the the death of the Messiah Resurrection Sunday of course he is raised from the dead as God's King uh, as our Savior as uh, the Lord of the universe and of course Holy Saturday which we can look at uh, perhaps on Sunday. Holy Saturday is the day where his disciples had to live an entire day without the Messiah. Their dreams, their hopes, their visions shattered. And so, so, so we just see these in the liturgical calendar, revelation, atonement, God breaking his people and setting them free from their preconceived ideas of what the Messiahship would look like. And then finally, resurrection. So, we're going to look uh, in the New Testament writings and we're going to uh, go to Matthew. And we're going to go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, beginning in the 32nd verse. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene. Simon by name, they compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the 
charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if God so desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now of course those are the beginning words to Psalm 22. And we will go to Psalm 22 momentarily. That's one of the seven sayings uh, that the Lord uh, spoke from the cross. <clears throat> and some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now, the surrounding story of the death of Christ, if you, if you look at the references, the references speak prophetically. They speak prophetically of what the Lord was experiencing that moment. Just as he would have seen in the 118th Psalm, which was uh, read the previous evening, even as he would have understood that approaching the cross when he made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem a week before, as he would have seen that the Lord was laying out a panoramic view prophetically in Scripture, saying, Son, this is the divine narrative. This is the divine story. This is what you must enter into. As Jesus would have seen it with the 118th Psalm, previous to the crucifixion, on the cross, the events that were going on all point to the 22nd Psalm. You'll see when we read it that some of the very things that David wrote a thousand years earlier to this, that David wrote prophetically, would have triggered the reality that Jesus was in. And Jesus, again, would have inserted himself into another story, and that's the 22nd Psalm. In fact, the mockers actually quote the 22nd Psalm uh, to Jesus. And, you know, the mockers, uh, you know, uh, being described as some of the religious leaders would have been aware of the implications of the 22nd Psalm. And in essence, were, were uh, uh, mocking Jesus with that. But Jesus then, through the grace of the Father, through his seeing and understanding that even what the mockers were doing, even what the soldiers were doing, even what the tormentors were doing, were part of the Father's plan and purpose, it would have stirred faith in Jesus. It would have stirred faith in Jesus. And see, this is a picture of how the Word of God works for us. The Word of God is a story. And for us, as we follow Jesus, as we follow the Lord in faith, as we seek our Father's will, as we seek to fulfill the destiny that the Lord has laid out for us as the body of Christ, we need to enter ourselves into that particular portion of the story in which we find ourselves. Because when, when we place ourselves in God's story, regardless of what's going on, as, as Allison was saying when she quoted Isaiah 53 at the start of worship, when we insert ourselves into God's story, it is a reminder that the Lord is in control. He's in control of the universe. He's in control of human history. He's in control of our destiny. He's in control of the lives uh, of our loved ones. He's in control of the 
prophetic promises that have not yet been fulfilled in our lives. And because he is in control, history is moving not in some random fashion, not being controlled by the demonic, not being controlled by evil human beings, but history is moving forward according to the Lord's purposes. And this gives us faith. This gives us encouragement. Watch as we go through Psalm 22, how many things you're going to see in Psalm 22 that Jesus was seeing. And remember, Jesus is already seeing different things in that psalm taking place. And as a good Jew in an oral tradition, in an oral society, primarily memorization as opposed to reading, you know, Jesus didn't pull out his cell phone on the cross and read Psalm 22. It was there in his heart and in his mind. And he knew that the Lord was the God of steadfast love. And even as he began to realize that the Father was turning his face from the Son, as the Son was becoming the sin offering of Isaiah 53, the hand of the Lord is on him to preserve him and to get him through this. And, and we want to look at Psalm 22 as if whether Jesus quoted the entire psalm aloud or just that first verse, Eli, Eli, Lema, Sabachthani, and then just quoted the rest to himself in his heart and his mind. We're going to go to Psalm 22 for our, our Good Friday reading to understand the sacrifice of the Lord. This is called by one biblical scholar, Psalm 22. If we read the, the inscription, the heading of the psalm, it says, to the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David, the doe as in a, a, a female deer, which Interestingly enough, and I'm going to read a quote from one of the rabbis about that inscription, depending on how you point that word, it could be translated the doe of the dawn or the strengthening of the dawn. One Bible scholar calls Psalm 22 a liturgy for one threatened with death. Let's quote, uh, first of all, a rabbi, a uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch and what he shares with us about this particular heading to the psalm. He says, this word translated by some the doe of the dawn can mean actually the strengthening of the dawn or the invigoration that comes from the dawn. And, and he speaks about the dawn the dawn is, is, just what precedes the dawn is that particular time when it's not night and it's not day. It's a liminal state. A liminal state is a, a, a place that somebody's in and it's neither here nor there. Uh, a liminal state is, is a place between uh, a place we've left and a place we're headed for. It's a time of confusion because this particular time it's, it's, you don't know whether it's dark, you don't know whether it's light, and, and one of the things that Hirsch emphasizes is that things to the sight are indistinguishable at this particular time. It's hard to make out what things really are as you're peering out into this particular time just before the dawn. He says, this is the time when the mind cannot distinguish between darkness and light. However, it's also the time when it becomes possible once more for the eye to discern, for the eye to see as the dawn begins to peer in through the darkness. <clears throat> Objects, though not yet clearly distinguishable from one another, can already be recognized if an effort is made to search for them. Psalm 22 thus sings of the renewed vigor which a man, even though he is still surrounded by darkness, may derive from the knowledge that morning cannot be far away. 
the darkest hour is before the dawn, just before the dawn. And it is in the hope that dawn is coming that uh, a man uh, attempts to see his way through this, to come through this, this time of indistinguishable reality to be strengthened by the dawn. This psalm gives expression to the thoughts and emotions that come to Israel in the midst of the dark night of its exile. The rabbis taught that David prophetically, because of the struggles he went through in his life, struggles with Saul, struggles with Absalom, struggles with with, uh, his kingship uh, being established and sustained, all the enemies that came against him. David's life was one enemy after another. Because of that, prophetically, he wrote this psalm. Now, we know prophetically it was for his son, Jesus, for his son, Yeshua, who would become the Messiah of God's people. But initially, it had to do with the fact that Israel would go into exile, and in exile they would be in a dark period under the rule and reign of the powers of darkness. Israel believes the Lord has forsaken her, but yet she knows somehow that her relationship with him has not been completely severed. Just as Israel remembers the aid which God had always given to her fathers, In time of trouble, so even while surrounded by her foes, Israel nurtures the memory of that past divine support which always upheld her in all her fights. Thus Israel receives strength. See, this is the strengthening of the dawn. That's the title. Thus Israel receives strength and the confidence that the Lord will send his help once again. This conviction helps Israel find consolation in the face of crushing losses. Then, Israel delights ultimately in the glad realization that it is this very experience of God's hand amidst all her sufferings that has enabled her to proclaim God's might unto all future generations as well as all the rest of mankind. Only when mankind is taught to worship God's sovereignty will it find happiness on this earth. Men will be able to enjoy life at its fullness only if they subordinate themselves to the will of the Lord. The dawn is this intimation of the bright future that will emerge from out of the night of Israel's exile. It is the promising dawn which sends forth the first rays of sunlight, heralding a new day for the future of Israel together with all the rest of the nations of the earth. Now I read that, if a rabbi understood that to be the basic meaning behind this psalm, Jesus being raised in rabbinic Judaism as he was, being taught by the rabbis, Jesus would have understood that psalm that way as well. But now Jesus on the cross, as he begins to see Psalm 22 emerging before him in the, the mocking, in the crucifixion, in the, the, even the, the voices of the thieves surrounding him, the Romans, soldiers, the, uh, the, the Jewish leaders, as he begins to see he realizes the dark night of his exile is going to be the complete fulfillment of the dark night of Israel's exile. Israel has gone through exile, come out, but that was just a foreshadowing for Jesus himself, what he is about to experience. And as the rabbis taught him from the word, the Lord would never desert his people in exile. And so the Jesus who starts out the psalm, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, knows from that psalm that God will 
not forsake him ultimately. The Lord will be at his right hand to deliver him through unto victory, not only for himself, but for all the people of God. Now, when we outline this psalm, the psalm is really, there, there, there are three parts to the psalm. The psalm starts out in lament. Verses 1 through 21 will be the, the cry of despair, the cry of anguish, the cry of pain when God deserts his Messiah, when the Father turns away from his Son and allows his Son to be a sin offering. But within that lament of verses 1 through 21, secondly, there will be elements of prayer. Verses 11 and verses 19 through 21. And what this teaches us is that in the midst of our lament, and we will not be spared lament because we enter into exile with Jesus. We enter into the cross with Jesus. We enter into the sufferings of Jesus with Jesus as his apostolic people, as his disciples, pick up the cross and follow me. Paul says, of course, in Colossians 1, 24, he fills up what is lacking in the body of Christ, of the sufferings of Christ in his own flesh. Paul uh, recognizes that uh, we who belong to the Lord will live out this process of death as well in our serving him, in our obeying him, in our following him. And, and, of course, this will be the, the mightiest manifestation of God's power in our lives. So there's lament in this psalm, but the lament is punctuated by prayer. Jesus is the sin offering for us. He's the intercessory prayer. His own life becomes an intercessory prayer as he bears our sin. Isaiah 53 concludes with that statement. But he's also a model for us. We must recognize that when we have seasons of lament, when we face inevitably the same darkness that Jesus faced, when we may feel at times, as Allison said, looking at it from the standpoint of Isaiah 53, and I'll say it now from the standpoint of Psalm 22, when we come into those times of lament, when we come into those times where we ourselves may look and say, Lama, Lama, uh, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We must punctuate that lament with prayer. And then the third part of the psalm, which is the conclusion, it finally erupts into praise and thanksgiving, verses 22 through 31. This is the meaning of Good Friday. So as we conclude by reading through this psalm, let's recognize what Jesus went through for us, the fact that he suffers the ultimate separation from God so that we can praise and worship, and let us also be encouraged to know that when we have our little moments of suffering, the New Testament calls it just moments, light moments of affliction. Nothing like what Jesus went through, who took upon himself all the sin of all the world, who took upon himself all the demonic trauma, demonic poison, demonic injury that all human beings had ever faced, and he did all this sin and Satan and, and, and the full extent of the punishment of the law. Cursed is everyone who will be hung on a tree. He was hung on the cross on that tree as one who was cursed of God. And then in the midst of all of that, the full weight of the law, the full weight of demonic oppression, the full weight of sin, he must also bear the full weight of separation from his Father. Our affliction, regardless of what we experience, is a tiny portion. Our light affliction, 
works for us a far greater eternal weight of glory. So let's, let's watch Jesus. We start out with lament. And we'll start out with verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? And watch this. Jesus senses his farness from God. And when he prays, he asks for a restoration of nearness. Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. And as the the rabbi quoted, but there's that faint image, even in the midst of this God-forsakenness, a remembrance, though, he is faithful. He is the God of steadfast love. He is the God of faithfulness. He is the God of grace. He is the God of truth. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And see that already in the third verse, the reminder here, the contrast to God forsakenness is the praise of God, the worship of God. The God who is far away will always be brought near to us by praise and worship, not by shaking our fist at God, not by lashing out in bitterness toward others, but praising God. In you our fathers trusted. First time. They trusted and you delivered them. Second time. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And the the remembrance of praise, the, 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 the dim light of the candle of the spirit within him, It's beginning to ignite on the remembrance of praise recognizes trust. So we start in worship. We start in praise. Praise births trust. Praise births births hope within us. In you they trust and were not put to shame. And not put to shame means they failed to fulfill your purposes. That's what it means to experience shame. We fail to fulfill God's purposes, but we are not going to fail. Jesus is not going to fail because he lives, we shall live also. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him for he delights in him. And you see Jesus is reminded of the verses from Psalm 22 that Matthew 27 has already recorded as playing out before him. This is what brought him to Psalm 22. So even the enemy's worst taunts, the enemy's worst mocking, the enemy's worst efforts to drive us away from the Lord actually drive us into his word And when we're driven into his word, we become part of the narrative, part of the story, and we remember God is in control and our God is a good God. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. This constant repetition of trust. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. How did Jesus get through the crucifixion? Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That's praise and worship. That's trust. And he will direct your paths. On you, I was cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. So far, the term that Jesus has used, he hasn't used Yahweh yet. Quoting this psalm, he's using El, which is not God, the God of all the world. It's El is the chief God, the supreme God, the God over all the gods of the earth, the God over all history, the God over all cosmic powers, the God over life and death. He's crying out to him as David, his forefather, did when he penned this psalm and prophesied these words. 
Jesus is calling to the Most High God. And then comes, we move from lament to the first prayer, and notice the prayer. The prayer isn't even initially, deliver me from this, Lord. Remove this from me. He's already prayed that in the Garden of Gethsemane. If it be your will, let this cup pass. But if not, not my will, but yours be done. And his prayer, and this is a pattern for us, for prayer in the midst of difficult times. Lord, you don't seem to be there. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, the ultimate God the true God, the mighty God, the God over all gods, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His prayer is, draw near unto me. When we find ourselves in our cross moments, when we find ourselves in our difficult time, we pray, draw near unto me, Lord, in your presence. If I just feel it, if I can just touch the hem of your garment, I can make it through. Be not far from me. Trouble is near and there is none to help. I need God as my helper. Trouble is near, but I need you to be near unto me, Lord. I need you to be nearer to me than trouble. And then back to the lament. And now this lament begins to take on metaphoric pictures pictures. I've always seen in this that Jesus' eyes, it's, he's, it started opening to the invisible realm and he started seeing the demonic attacks that were against him. <clears throat> Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surrounding me. They open wide their mouths at me, like a ravening and roaring lion. He sees lion-like figures. He sees bull-like figures. The, the bulls of Bashan were known as the largest of all the bulls in, in Palestine with, of course, uh, monstrous horns. Bull, lion, eagle, human. He sees the human beings surrounding him, mocking him. Now he sees the faces of bulls and lions. And you know right now you're talking about the living creatures. You're talking about the cherubim. You're talking about spiritual entities with their bull faces and their lion faces and their human faces and their eagle faces. He begins to see into the spirit realm as these demonic forces start coming against him. God has turned against him. The sin of all humankind is upon him. And now the demonic figures are coming toward him to sink their poisonous teeth into him. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lions. And then he begins to deal with his actual physical reality. I mean, crucifixion was a brutal practice. It was a horrific way to die. You know, we've heard the expression that COVID-19, for those who passed, it's a horrific way to die. Crucifixion is a horrific punishment. It's meant to inflict terror. It's meant to inflict harm. It's meant to inflict damage. And now Jesus begins as he's rehearsing this psalm. I mean, he, it's like Teresa Vandervest says, something that, uh, that uh, was written 3,000 years ago applies to us today at this moment. And she was speaking of our, our reading of the psalms, which we've gone through the past year at Lord of the Harvest. Well, this is something written 1,000 years earlier applied to Jesus right there. And this, the, the horrible, the horrific um, physical damage and trauma and pain that crucifixion caused. He says, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You, God, Place me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. Another image. Dogs, unclean beasts. We love our dogs, but they were unclean beasts in Israel at that time. Another picture of, of just the, the, the whole reality of, of, of the demonic uh, igniting 
the, the hatred and hostility of human beings. Don't cast your pearls before swine or give what is holy to dogs lest they turn and trample you. It's a, it's a picture of demonically inspired human cruelty and violence. For dogs encompass me. They, they, they surround me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. That, uh, that is actually, we have some, some difficult um, verses here to translate. That, they have pierced my hands and feet, is one potential translation of the Hebrew at that verse, which of course would clearly accord with Jesus' crucifixion. Um, it can also be translated, um, the, they circle me like a lion and gnaw at my hands and feet. It can be like these, these, these beast-like creatures gnawing uh, at Jesus' hands and feet. Well, perhaps it's both. The, the, the physical nails uh, represented just demonic torment to Jesus. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Jesus had looked down and saw them doing that before he was even dead. They, they're, they're casting lots for his possessions. When a person who's ill is sitting there and the family's circling around the bed and they're already fighting over the will, basically what they're saying is, you're already dead, we don't care. And so Jesus is speaking of the, the forsakenness of that moment. He, I'm not even dead and I'm witnessing they're dividing my cloak among them. And then back to prayer. The lament is punctuated by a second prayer. And I want to read this in the order that it is written in the Hebrew. This is what it says in the Hebrew. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. Again, draw near unto me, Lord. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Be my helper. Be my helpmate. You know, that's the same word, the helpmate. Our spouse is called our helpmate. But the Lord is called our helpmate to our helper. And where scripture says, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. Though my spouse forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. Though my friends and family and fellow members in the church forsake me, the Lord will not forsake me. The Lord will be there. Jesus cries out to his father to come and help him, come and assist him. We're at a meeting this morning, and, and Tom Porta, Pastor Tom Porta was on at a Zoom meeting, and he said how in Luke, remember when Jesus was sweating blood and, and, and praying for the Father, the Lord sent an angel to come and minister to Jesus. And Tom was making the point that we need each other and we need God. If even Jesus needed angelic intervention, angelic help to get him through the difficult time, we need angels. May we in the body of Christ become angels to each other in this hour of darkness and exile. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Now watch how it works here, because this is how it is in the Hebrew. Save me from the mouth of the lion and from the horns of the wild oxen. That's those demonic forces coming against them, coming, uh, they're coming against Jesus. And then the final statement of verse 21 in the Hebrew, you have answered me. There's a turning in the midst of the suffering, in the midst of the God forsakenness, the one who cries out to God in prayer, the one who has that glimmer of you are holy and worthy to be praised. The one who continually says, but I must trust you. I must trust you. I must trust you. Crying out to the Lord, 
worshiping, praising, thanking him in our hearts, even in the darkest moments, and putting our trust in him births a heavenly response. You have answered me. And in the midst of the cross, in the midst of the suffering, and we know right after he said this in Matthew 27, it says, and after this, he gave up the ghost. The Lord, as he gave up the ghost, went into the grave in faith. Went into the grave knowing his father had heard him. Went into the grave understanding that the God who may in this time between night and day when truth and reality and what's really going on becomes difficult to discern and difficult to see. The God who allows his people to go into exile is still the God of steadfast love and faithfulness and will never forsake his people. And look at the remainder of the psalm. An explosion, an explosion of praise. Jesus would have said at that point, he would have quoted the remainder of the psalm, I will tell of your name to my brothers. Now, actually, the first time, the first time he invokes Yahweh was in verse 19. In this this final prayer, the prayer in the midst of lament, he goes from being my God, my God, he becomes the Lord, he becomes Yahweh. He becomes his intimate. And whether or not Jesus overcame that God-forsakenness on the cross or didn't overcome it until he was raised from the dead, whatever the timing was, he, uh, he recognizes. He says, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I commend my spirit. Father, Yahweh. And then... Praise for the remainder of the psalm, and we'll close it out. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. See, Jesus moves from the individual suffering to his praise is for all his brothers and sisters. See, Jesus did what he did because he carried us in his heart. He did what he did for us. He did what he did on our behalf. And so he moves from this horrendous suffering to becoming the worship leader, to becoming the worship leader of all his brothers and sisters who would be given new life because of his death, because of his resurrection. You who fear the Lord, you who fear Yahweh, praise him. It's not just, I'm going to praise you. It's you who fear the Lord, praise him. He's calling all of us, the, the people that are mocking him, the people that are, are, are blaspheming him, slandering him, being hostile toward him, uh, manifesting all kind of violence toward him. He now becomes the worship leader. By the way, the worship that Jesus would have been conducting at this was virtual worship because the people hadn't caught up yet to the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So maybe sometimes in virtual worship, what we're doing is we're imaging Christ on the cross. Oh, when we get together, and we'll be together, we'll be together for, 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 for some great worship in the future. When we're together, we will worship as the body of Christ. Virtually, when, when, when we're worshiping virtually, we're worshiping under the banner of the cross. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted one. And that's where the rabbis said, verse 24 right here is the name of the Messiah. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. He praises God because he is the God of steadfast love and faithfulness. 
and he hears his people in exile. He hears his people in suffering. He hears his people even when it might appear that he's forsaken us. He forsook the son and Jesus was forsaken that he doesn't have to forsake us. Hallelujah, Lord. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. I'm going to praise him in the great congregation. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Now this meal had to do with a memorial offering. We've talked about that before. And the next verse describes the memorial offering. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. A remembrance is a memorial. The memorial offering was when we said this was a liturgy of one condemned to death. When someone was delivered from death by the Lord, they would come and they would bring their friends and they would bring their family to the temple and they would celebrate They would eat a meal together and the one who'd been delivered from death would declare the greatness and the glory of the Lord and everyone there would eat and be satisfied. Everyone there would seek the Lord and praise the Lord and everyone there would declare our hearts will live forever because you are the God who delivers us from death. So Jesus on the cross, is he's he's quoting this and remembering, I'm going to die but the Lord is going to raise me from the dead and I will come back and have a memorial offering with my disciples, which of course we know he did. That's why Jesus was always eating uh, after the resurrection from the dead. For those 40 days and 40 nights, he ate food with them. He was celebrating the memorial offering that Yahweh, that God the Father had delivered him and would deliver his disciples as well. But notice in verse 27, it goes beyond just thank you for Israel and it extends to the nations of the earth. The Lord has the nations of the earth in his view when he dies and is raised from the dead and established as the king of the universe. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you for The kingship belongs to Yahweh. God is king, just like we saw in our Psalms. The kingship of the Lord delivers the earth. For the kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. The prosperous are literally in the Hebrew, the fat of the earth, the fat ones of the earth. Those who are enriched will eat. Before him, shall bow all who go down to the dust. Those who are fat will be delivered and those who are broken and impoverished will bow down and worship before him. The Lord is going to be raised from the dead to bring God's people to worship him. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. And see, that verse came to Jesus. Yes, Those who are well off will worship you, Father. Those who are not well off will worship you, Father. And those like me who cannot keep themselves alive, we will worship you too. Jesus knew death was not the end of the story. He was going to go down into the grave and ransom all those souls that had been kept for centuries, thousands of years, out of heaven, if you will, because now the Messiah could go there and steal them all back from the devil and bring them back to the Lord. Now, the final two verses. It's very interesting. Jesus is able to go to the grave but rejoice in his God because he knows he's going to have a posterity. He's going to have a seed. He's going to have fruit. He's going to have a legacy. He's going to have those who will be his sons and daughters who will receive the heavenly inheritance. 
verses 30 and 31, and we close. May my descendants serve him. May my descendants serve the Father. May my descendants serve the God over all the gods. May my descendants serve Yahweh and the Father. May my descendants serve him. May they tell about his lordship to another generation. May they come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born, for he, the Lord, has done it. And he gives up the ghost. He gives up his spirit to his father. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, knowing that his job will succeed, that his mission will succeed, that the goal for which the Father raised him up will succeed. There will be generations after generation after generation after generation who, like us on Good Friday, will declare the story of the victory of God in Jesus. Father, we come before your throne in Jesus' name. May the church be blessed. May your people be blessed. May the nations of the earth be blessed to turn to you, Lord. May America, Lord, be blessed to turn to you in this hour, Lord. May people who don't know you be blessed to turn to you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for Good Friday. Yes, we've got to live through Holy Saturday. We've got to live. There will be times in our lives where we have to live through a season where our understanding of who the Messiah is and what he's going to do is going to go down into the grave. It's going to be shattered. It's going to be removed. Just as your disciples, they all had a vision and an understanding and a perspective and a desire for how they wanted things to be. And it wasn't to be. It was going to be the way your father wanted it to be. Yes, we're going to have those Holy Saturday periods where the men are going to hide in fear and the women are going to go and uh, to, to put spices on the body of Jesus. Neither one of them really understanding he is risen, or in this case, he will be risen. But that didn't stop you from being raised from the dead and established the kingship of the Lord. In other words, our ignorance doesn't stop God from working and moving. Now, Lord, we're... There's so many things going on right now and we don't understand. We don't understand, Father. But you know what? Our ignorance is not going to stop your plan from coming to pass. Because I live, Jesus says, you will live also. We thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodbye, church. God bless you to love and serve the Lord. We will see you on Sunday.